Hey everyone, this is Jason at Martin Guitar. Today we're going to look at 10 of the most interesting and rare instruments that we have around us in our museum. This is an 1834 Martin. So this is the oldest Martin guitar known to exist. We can date it from the sales ledgers we have in our archives to early 1834. When you look at it, you can see how C.F. Martin Sr. was trained, the guitars that he learned to build while he was in Vienna studying under Johann Stauffer. So a lot of the elements on this guitar were patented by Stauffer. You have the headstock shape, the tuning gears, so there's a plate that cover, covers this, but these are actual geared tuners underneath the plate. Then there's a clock key that adjusts the neck. So if you look at the fingerboard, it floats over the top of the guitar's top, and you can raise and lower the entire height of the neck. So kind of uh, like an early truss rod. This is the size one Dagoni. This was built for a performer named Madame Dagoni, who was pretty much the most popular concert guitarist in the United States on the East Coast from the early 1840s up until around 1890. The majority of early Martin guitars were built for women, and that's why back then the sizes were smaller. You hear that term parlor guitar because they were played by women in the parlors of their homes to, en to entertain guests. And so early on, the guitar was mostly an instrument for women. So what's so significant about this guitar is that this is the earliest known guitar to have an x brace top. And so pretty much anybody that builds a flat top steel string guitar now uses some form of x bracing So this is uh, exactly how the top of this, the Dagoni guitar is braced. This is a custom shop reproduction. The theory behind why C.F. Martin Sr. invented X bracing, so he was building guitars that had a Spanish style influence because he saw how popular they were. So he was using this square tapered headstock, uh, similar body shapes, but he, he preferred to use a pin bridge. And if you would fan brace one of these uh, guitars, one of the tops, and use a pin bridge, there would be a chance you could hit one of the braces when you were drilling a, a pinhole. So we see in the late 1830s and early 1840s, him experimenting with these different variations of bracing, where eventually he came upon X bracing and used it on this guitar. So, I mean, really, this is kind of Martin's first signature model. Long before we were building guitars for John Mayer and Eric Clapton, we were building them for Madame Dagoni. In the tradition of great D18s, this is Hank Williams' 1947 D18. He frequently bought instruments at a dealer in Montgomery, Alabama, and that's where he ended up picking up this guitar. Uh, he used it for sev several years, and then he ended up giving it to a friend of his named Curly Williams. I don't think they were related, but uh, Curly used it for quite a bit of his career, and then Curly ended up giving it to his daughter. So this is, you know, shows a lot of great wear on it. It's uh, pretty common guitars from this era to have that buckle rash. You can definitely tell the neck was played a lot. Uh, he owned several Martins. I mean, a couple of D28s, which he's mostly photographed with, but he also owned a D45, a triple O18 that he had heavily customized with uh, a lot of pearl inlay. And for some reason, you see some of his guitars with the mismatched bridge pins. So I don't know if he just had a, a habit of losing them or he just liked the alternating black and white bridge pins, but. So 
this is a 1930 OM45 Deluxe. And when it comes to rare guitars in our museum, this is probably the rarest. There were only 11 built that year. Uh, and it was a, a shortage of supplies. Martin acquired these pick guards from an outside vendor and just couldn't get them any longer. This was by far the most expensive guitar that Martin offered in their 1930 catalog. You know, it's classic style 45 appointments for that time with the torch inlaid on the headstock, the snowflake fingerboard inlay. Now they added the snowflakes on the bridge and the inlay pickguard to make this a deluxe. I mean, the rest of it is typical style 45 with your pearl inlay on the top, back, and sides. Now, a lot of people identify this with Roy Rogers if they watch old cowboy movies because he did play an original model of these one of these OM45s. And I guess he bought his when he was still known as Leonard Sly and he bought it in a pawn shop in Los Angeles for I think around $30. <laughs> This is a 1926 Style 1K ukulele that was owned by Richard Conter. So Richard Conter uh, was in the United States Navy. He was also a well-known ukulele composer from Brooklyn, New York. And he volunteered to go on the first expedition over the North Pole with Admiral Byrd. So he was a, a crew member on the ship that Byrd was on. He became friends with Byrd's pilot, Floyd Bennett. And so Contra asked Bird if he would smuggle the ukulele on the plane that Bennett and Bird were going to fly over the North Pole. So uh, Bennett took the ukulele, saw that it, you know, weighed next to nothing, and said, uh, "You know what? I'll put it under my seat." So he did that, and Bennett and Bird made the flight over the North Pole. He gave the ukulele back to Contra. Contra had the crew of the ship sign it. Then they had a reception for them in Washington, D.C. And at the reception, he had the president at the time, Calvin Coolidge, sign it, Thomas Edison signed it, Amelia Earhart, a lot of famous dignitaries at the time. And he also volunteered to go on the first expedition over the South Pole, and he took the ukulele with him on that. Now we're making, we're making this reproduction where all of the signatures are laser engraved into the koa wood. So when it comes to historical significance, this might be the most historically significant instrument we have in our museum. So here we have a Ditson 111. So this is the original Dreadnought guitar. So the story behind the Ditson 111 is uh, in 1916, Martin built an instrument for a performer from Hawaii named Makia Kialakai. So they built a guitar that was a half inch wider, a half inch deeper, and a half inch longer than a standard triple O. And during this time, Martin was building a special line of instruments for their largest dealer, the Ditson Company and they had this wide waist design. So Ditson saw the drawings for the Kialakai guitar and asked Martin to build them something similar in that wide waist design. And so Martin came up with this, the Ditson 111. They weren't quite sure what to call it and because it was World War I era, the largest warships at the time were the HMS Dreadnoughts from the British Navy, so they borrowed the name of the warship for the guitar. So there were less than 30 of these built until Ditson went out of business and then Martin started building the Dreadnought under their own name. This is the first D28. It was built in 1931, so as I talked about with the Ditson 111, Martin built, only built the Dreadnought for the Ditson company until they went out of business and then Martin started building the Dreadnought under their own name. So initially they offered the D1 and the D2 for one of their dealers in Chicago, but then they decided, you know what, we should offer these guitars for all of our dealers. So they came out with the D18 and the D28. So this is the first of 
the most iconic acoustic guitars ever to be built. So it's still the original 12 fret design. You have, uh, you know, that wide neck and that longer body. But I mean, it has all the other components that a D28 is known for. This has Brazilian rosewood back and sides, an Adirondack spruce top, the herringbone top inlay, diamonds and squares on the fingerboard. What's so significant about this? It's a 1926 0018, and it is signed by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. So this is a big one for all the baseball fans out there. I know you can find baseballs and baseball bats signed by them, but I'm pretty much 100% sure that this is the only guitar that both of them signed. And uh, the reason why they signed it was they were campaigning for Al Smith, who was running for the presidency of the United States in 1928 against Herbert Hoover. He eventually lost, but he had some famous friends. All the signatures on the top are from mostly radio entertainers from the New York City area, but he happened to be friends with uh, the Babe and Lou, and uh, so Babe Ruth, right next to my finger there, and Lou Gehrig, right down here, next to the bridge. So when it comes to collectible vintage flat top guitars, this is uh, the one that I think most people would like to have. This is a pre-war D45. A lot of people refer to it as the holy grail of acoustic guitars. Only 91 were built because production stopped because of World War II. So whenever you see one of these guitars come to market, they're usually well into six figures, even if they have repairs done to them. So this guitar is number 80 out of 91. Uh, it has all of the great features that pre-war D28s have. Adirondack spruce top with the pearl inlay around the top, back, and sides. Brazilian rosewood for back and sides. These great Grover G111 tuning machines. And this feature is the hexagon inlay that Martin switched the D28 to in uh, late 1938 because originally they used that snowflake design, but since uh, jazz guitars were so popular, they switched to the more Art Deco hexagon inlay that they were using on their F-series arch tops. One of the things that makes pre-war Martin so collectible is that, I mean, this is still a, really a modern guitar. You look at it and, I mean, this is something that you could pick up and play whatever songs you would want to play on an acoustic guitar. It's a steel string flat top dreadnought. It gives you the tone you want, and the volume you want. It's just an amazing instrument. So this is Grandpa, Kurt Cobain's 1953 D18. So the story behind this guitar is it was owned by Mary Lou Lord, who is a folk musician from the Boston area. And she became a fan of Nirvana. And she met up with the band when they were touring, uh, when they were in the Boston area. And this was before their Nevermind album came out. So they were relatively unknown at, at that time. Her and Kurt Cobain hit it off. Uh, they began dating and they were getting ready to tour f to support Nevermind. And so she knew that he needed an acoustic guitar for the tour, so she gave him this guitar that they both called Grandpa. She knew that he loved it and needed the guitar, so she gave it to him. So he used it on tour in support of the Nevermind album. And then eventually she ended up getting it back. Uh, at that point, she ended up meeting Elliot Smith and she let him use the guitar for a while and it came back into her possession and she ended up uh, eventually auctioning the guitar. But as you can see, it's definitely, they, they called it Grandpa because it was kind of old and beat up. And uh, you can definitely see the pick where, the pick where that Kurt Cobain put into it because a left-handed player, you and Kurt would have been playing it like this, no pick guard down there, and definitely would have worn through the top pretty easily. He owned this guitar before he purchased the guitar that he used on Unplugged. And we think this, this guitar is the reason why he wanted another D18. All right, so we were gonna do 10. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I lost count and grabbed this guitar, so. 
Uh, this is a 1943 0018. Uh, it was owned by a gentleman named Fred Clay, who was in a country band in Southern California. And he happened to know uh, a guy named Leo Fender. And at that time, Leo was building amps and PAs and pedal steel guitars. And so Fred knew, you know, about the pedal steel. So he went into Leo's shop and said, hey, Leo, I'm having trouble being heard in my band. Can you help me out? So Leo Fender took one of his pedal steel pickups and put it in Fred Clay's 00018. I'm guessing it helped him out. You know, it really doesn't look too pretty, but this was Leo Fender's first experiment at electrifying a fretted stringed instrument. So that was just a teaser of the roughly 180 instruments we have on display in our museum. So if you want to come see what everything that is on display, we're open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, and just come and check it out. I'm sure you'll find something that you find interesting. <laughs>